On Sunday, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu joined Nigerians to celebrate the country's 63rd Independence Day anniversary. His first as Nigerian's leader since he assumed office. President Tinubu in his broadcast reinstated his pledge to reshape and modernize the country's economy and to secure lives, properties, and our dignity. The president also highlighted the various policies his government has put in place so far, including the removal of forced subsidy, which he said was important for the country's growth. He also stated that no one is greater or lesser than the other, and the triumph that the nation has achieved shall define us all. Different reactions have continued to trail Mr. President made in broadcast. While some actually said it seems that he's giving up the hope that we truly need, why? The main opposition PDP said that the speech was empty, devoid of ideas, and merely aspirational in the wrong direction. But whichever direction you seem to think about it on today's edition of The Big Story, we, in our usual style, we critically look at the high point of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu's made in uh, Independent Day speech. And in every way, cipher if it's merely aspirational or rather a commitment of what his administration will do to help Nigerians deal with the pains and sufferings they are presently going through. And that is high point of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu Independence Day speech. And that's what we're having as a major discourse today on The Big Story. While you indeed agree with me, that is going to be a big one. Looking at some of the major high points at, um, of his maiden Independence Day uh, speech uh, that he gave to Nigerians on Sunday. But anyway, we are right here in the studios on Tuesday. And to help us talk about this, we have no other person but our very own as it concerns uh, looking at uh, some of the high points. I'm talking of no other person but Mr. Gideon Ogums. Uh, good morning and welcome to the show, Star. Good morning, Mike. Well, anyway, I quickly want us to start and dive straight into it. Uh, now, uh, he said that this um, is um, yet uh, a hopeful day. Uh, he said that on Sunday, and in every way, still re echoing his renewed hope mantra. Uh, he said, yes, his independence has been turbulent and unstable, but there is hope for the country. I know such statement uh, was what brought the rot of the opposition by saying it's merely aspirational. Well, anyway, so two quick questions. Now, should we be living on hope, praying and hoping every day that things would yet be better, or rather looking at issues and tackling them head on? That's my number one question. And is there real hope for a country in the shortest possible time, knowing that all the indices seem to be in red? Mm. Yes, we should have hope. Okay. Right. Uh, so let me answer your first question correctly. Okay. The day a man loses hope, yes. he becomes hopeless. Okay. And uh, the dying man will die. Okay. But Nigeria is not dead, but it's dying. Okay. So we must retain hope, and with hope, salvage will come. So we should be praying and hoping. Uh -huh. I'm Pray. not tackling the challenge. No, no, I've, no. I've not added praying. Oh, oh, oh. I said we should have hope. Well, you know hope. we are religious people. Yeah, okay. We should have hope. So with hope, we believe that the circumstances will now be tackled. Mm. Since we are not dead, then we must tackle it. And the tackling is the part of which I think the main opposition is using to trounce or flounce their, their well preparedness. Okay. Because if we have mentioned that against hope, these are the steps being taken pragmatically to reverse, to address these issues, it would not have been a futuristic hope okay. but an actualized hope but okay. the statement didn't, didn't get to that point you didn't get to that point well anyway that brings me to my second question you said we should keep uh, hoping but is there any hopefulness in the shortest possible time 
of things working out well. Knowing that almost all indices in, uh, in the red. Well, Ooh. we'll talk about the economy. Well, well, I would rather want to talk about that last. <laughs> I will look at insecurity, and uh, well, even on that day of his broadcast, about eight people were killed in Jaws. Um, come on. Okay. Do we have a reason to hope? Are there steps being taken to make the hope renewed? Mm. It's renewed hope. Mm. That is mandatory. I we yet to see. Well, I hope I'm really on a difficult. No, 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 no. We yet to see. Be frank, and in my own personal observation. Yes. The president had acted in his first four weeks as a president. Okay. But in the last four weeks, have acted as a board chairman. Hmm. Well, that's a strong one. So. He's tilting from being presidential to somebody that is listening to all the whips and caprices and advice, ideologies, is making him to become almost a weak. But, but, but should he not listen? Because that, that, that's Beautiful. where Beautiful. the ex, the former if, president. If you will allow me to land here. Okay, well, do ahead. Go ahead and land. My, one of my foster fathers told me in Kogi, he said, no matter how good an advice is, it remains an advice. Do you agree? Yes, I do. We are not looking for advice. We are looking for, for solutions. solutions. So no matter the mirage, the multitude of counsel and counseling is receiving, what are the steps he had taken? And who takes the step? Okay. So you discover that in the last, okay, except maybe between the last three days, because of the pressure labor have put everywhere, they must not go on strike on the third. They are now forced to make specific statements. If not, they've all been vague, promissory notes that you can hold them to. So it is that attitude that is making some of us to begin to say, no, this is not the man who read a speech and included in it subsidy is gone On his inaugural day. it wasn't in that speech but he put that made him we felt okay this is a man who is trying to work with the moment but suddenly we are seeing a man who is just wanting to go through the files and go through the files and at the end set up committees and committees then other committees to so, to review committee We've been this room before. We don't think we'll have time for that. Mm. Okay, anyway, ho hoping for the best. <laughs> That's what I'll say. But that, it, it brings me to uh, my next question and more of a highlight of his speech uh, where he affirmed that one of his most important, or rather, one of most, Nigeria's most important assets is our diversity. diversity and he urged citizens to remain united. I'll call for his speech as he talked about unity. And uh, my PD is definitely ready. Let, let's see if we take his speech as it concerns unity. And I'll come back and ask a critical question centered on that very speech he made on Sunday. Dear compatriots, it is my unique honor to address you on this day, the 63rd anniversary of our nation's independence, both as the president of our dear country and simply as a fellow Nigerian. On this solemn yet hopeful day, let us commend our founding fathers and mothers. Without them, there will have been no modern Nigeria. From the fading embers of colonialism, their activism, dedication, and leadership gave life to the belief in Nigeria as a sovereign an independent nation. Let us, at this very moment, affirm that as Nigerians, we are all endowed with the sacred right and individual gifts that God has bestowed on us as a nation and as human beings. No one is greater or lesser than the other. The triumph that Nigeria has achieved 
shall define us. The travails we have endured shall strengthen us, and no other nation or power on this earth shall keep us from my rightful place and destiny. This nation belongs to you, dear people. Love and cherish it as your very own. Nigeria is yours. Nigeria is remarkable in its formation and essential character. We are a broad and dynamic blend of ethnic groups, religious, tradition, and cultures. Yet, our bonds are yet intangible, strong, invisible, yet universal. We are joined by a common thirst for peace and progress, by the common dream of our prosperity and harmony, and by the unified ideas of tolerance and justice, forging a nation based on the fair application of these noble principles to a diverse population has been a task of significant blessing, but also serious challenge. Some people have said an independent Nigeria should never have come into existence. Some have said that our country will be torn apart they are forever mistaken. Here, our nation stands, and here we shall remain. Well, anyway, we'll remain with that very statement of his, as he said. Um, um, we're kind of a blend of dynamic blend of ethnic group, religion, tradition, and culture, yet our bonds are in tangible mm -hmm. yet strong mm -hmm. but it's quite ironic <laughs> that mr president's speech is coming at a time when nigerian national integration Cohesion. is being threatened Cohesion. by yeah. separatist movement and insurgency uh, well i know it's not necessarily fair for us to judge him and see how he has done as a consign unifying us as a people, knowing that he has not been there up to 150 days. But irrespective of that, I want to quickly ask you, within these days that he has been president, has he been able to unify the nation? And like he said, mm -hmm. keep that dynamic blend of different ethnic group and uh, religion belief, as he said. Right. Has he been this, able to? This is one day I'm in this studio and I'm very calm. Because <laughs> I I say the truth that I know. And I will need you to Here is a man time. who says that he knows that we are diversified. We are divergent in our religion, and in our views, in our political affiliate, language, the list is endless. Yes. And you ask me what has he done the to, unify? to unify? Has he been then able to do quickly, yes. I want to reference, look at his appointments. <laughs> because I told you that he has started varying away from that which makes it presidential. The authority of the president is no longer there. What we see today, if we put statistics to this, if I knew the question, we will have put the statistics for the Nigerians to look at. Okay. If we have made a thousand aids, for example, yes. we know that over 45 percent of that is from the southwest. With that gender, Ghana put together the cry for minorities. Where is where are the greatest problem of Nigeria? It's not in the major three tribes or four if you like. It's in the cry. Because at every time you try to make a minority a majority, mm -hmm. a minority exists. Yeah. So here is a man who preaches unity. And the same man is ensuring that we are more divided. There are every day we begin to feel that we are being marginalized. <laughs> the, the cry for marginalization is not so loud. You go about the issue of faith and security. Yeah. 
if you understand that not everyone is a Muslim or Christian or African traditional worshiper, in these 150 days you are referencing, can't we see what have happened to people who wanted to express their religious belief? And the president was not. Suddenly it looks as if he doesn't know that Nigerians have a right in a secular state to be who they want to be. People were arrested just because of their faith in a secular country called Nigeria, in under his tenorship. So what are we saying? Are you actually building bridges that makes people equal? Or you are rather unveiling the superiority of the or some group over the other? So that's why I said, if he knows these things he says with his mouth, why not the actions to follow up? Follow up. Okay, now we'll follow up with our discussion because we're really interested in looking at some of the high points. Now, still talking about unity and sacrifice, he talked about our security forces and how many of them have paid the ultimate price and sacrificed and appreciated them. The only truth in the statement. Well, well anyway, it's a truth that the still only stands. truth in the statement. But I'd I rather not say it for him, but rather let him say it himself. <laughs> and let's quickly return back and uh, get that from that he talked about security. And I'll come back and ask you a question centered on his discussion, or rather his statement. My administration shall always accord the highest priority to the safety of the people, inter service collaboration and intelligence sharing have been enhanced. Our service chiefs have been tasked with the vital responsibility of rebuilding the capacity of our security services. Here, I salute and commend our gallant security forces for keeping us safe and securing our territorial integrity. Many have paid the ultimate sacrifice. We remember them today and their families. We shall equip our forces with the ways and means needed to perform their urgent task on behalf of the people. Well, like I said, um, he said it, that um, well, as much as he appreciated uh, their supreme sacrifice, and um, he also said, he talked about taxing the service chiefs uh, to not only uh, reposition but to rebuild the capacity of the security service. But one of them would definitely be the right statement to make. But my question now is, have we seen any improved security situation under his watch? Because why I ask so, like I stated earlier, while he was giving that broadcast and that speech, eight persons were killed in Ado village in Bafa, local government area Plateau of Plateau State. State. And not only that, most recently the bandits seem to have gotten their voice and their action and their groove by going to kidnap students in the Zafara State University, Federal University, I mean. So my question is, we do know it's a proven fact that things have not improved security-wise under his watch. He might have had some few successes, but, well, it has not really been all rosy for him, especially as it concerns security. But my next question is, what does he need to do to walk the talk? Mike. Rather than giving or taxing services. I have said several here that when they enter so rock, I really don't know what happens to them. Because I've never been in that seat called president, so I don't really know. Okay, maybe you go there and change yeah. also. Because I don't know why they suddenly change. Do you know that our president was a major voice in civil society organizations? Do you know that he led protests in the streets of Lagos over anti-government, I'm oh, sorry, anti-people uh, policies of government? Then a man of that caliber under his watch, security is getting a very low grade. The simple answer is, what are the drivers of insecurity in Nigeria? Are they not three? Number one, hunger. Number two, religion. Number three, the quick to no job, blah, 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 yeah. blah, blah, blah. So, 
So if you take those who are into criminality for economic reasons, what do you need to do? Is it to gun them down like we've been doing? Or to tell the citizens, come, your problem is you don't have a job. I hear he wants to share 25,000 to some honorable, honorable households. I don't want to use his name. Well, he, now, those honorable households, what is 25,000? Why not think outside the box and say, okay, how many persons are unemployed, for example, in this locality? Maybe there are 1,000. Okay. How can we get this 1,000 person get to work? And so you gather the 25,000 for six more, whichever number of months, and say, okay, these are the fertilizers, these are the land, move 50 men in the military to such a location and make sure you farm. And so those people, they wake up in the morning, they go to their farms, they have a harvest, they sell, and before you know, the Nigerian spirit, we tell them, no, what I'm doing is too small, I can enlarge myself. And before you know, that circle will break out, and another circle will break. They don't think in that direction. You want to carry Nigeria money. But what will that do? After the man takes 25,000, he has eaten. 25,000 naira is finished. What will he do? Go back to crime. So the drivers of criminality are not being addressed. Let's go to kidnapping precisely. Why is this selling? Which is like banditry also. You now discover that the bandits and the kidnappers are using exactly the same thing. They kidnap for the purpose of buying their arms. The light arms in this nation, only God knows. So when you, you are kidnapped, now we are, we, there are security teams everywhere. Don't go out with ID card. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't, why? Because they are not just looking for anybody to kidnap anymore. They want to kidnap somebody with ways and means, if I borrow that language. So with that, are you addressing it? Go to Joss. Since 1991 or 1989, to date, Joss have always been boiling. What are the facts? Settlers and foreigners. Yes. Or indigenous and settlers. So and, yeah. Now, what is so difficult in settling that? If we really want to quell insecurity, because that of Plateau State is not it religion. All, it all, it's it not all. religion. Mm. It is land. Yes. So what stopped the federal government from saying, okay, you are a settler. This is what the Constitution says. You stay in a place for 15 years, you are a citizen. So do the rights and obligation of a citizen wherever you are. You that your founding fathers were here. Okay, these are your margins. Yeah. Now, if you begin to seek cooperation between the settler and the owner, I'm sure there will be no fight. But when you keep allowing them to wage war within themselves, I go with the grooms. Every day I have a grudge. This man killed my brother. He killed my friend. He did that. I'm looking for opportunity to retaliate. That in play too is retaliation. Because the real factor is not being addressed. Yeah, we we'll address one of the factors, especially as it concerns the high point of his discussion on Sunday, or rather, rather his speech on Sunday as it concerns uh, the 63rd anniversary of uh, this great nation. But anyway, we need to really go on a break, and when we come back, more discussion centered on that very Independence Day speech.